the assets and liabilities of world cultures. These days, individual countries and ethnic territories are largely cut off from each other and international travel has become difficult or even in some cases impossible. If we are even somewhat involved in modern culture, we must recognize that this state of affairs is virtually impossible to reconcile with the deepest inner longings of individuals. To an unbiased view, each human psyche incorporates the spiritual and cultural strivings of all civilized peoples. To use a financial metaphor, no one on earth today would be able to draw up an individual cultural balance sheet without including entries from all over the world. But what does the balance sheet of German culture look like right now? It is time to talk seriously about our culture's assets and liabilities. I hope, after the events of recent years, that I will not be misunderstood when I remind you of the brooding, deeply digging thinker Friedrich Nietzsche, <clears throat> of what the brooding, deeply digging thinker Friedrich Nietzsche wrote entitled The Birth of Tragedy in 1871. The young Nietzsche, reflecting on the moods passing through his soul in the year of Germany's unification, declared the imminent extirpation of the German spirit in favor of the German Reich. For many of the intervening years, such a declaration must have sounded frivolous to many people. Now, however, the realities of our situation have changed, and regardless of whether we think Nietzsche was right or not, his opinion expressed at the dawning of the new German Empire by someone who had truly suffered under 19th century materialism remains significant. Perhaps we may be permitted to expand upon the idea or perception that led to this opinion. Is it possible, for example, that the German people's current disastrous situation could restore the collective soul and spirit that Nietzsche feared had been extirpated? <coughs> These introductory words were simply meant to indicate the gravity of any general observations of modern soul-spiritual life and its challenges. Although Nietzsche fed only a fleeting light, excuse me, shed only a fleeting light on the modern cultural balance sheet in 1871, many 19th-century German thinkers attempted to address it seriously and conscientiously. I could list a number of such individuals, but I will mention only David Friedrich Strauss, whose materialism made him unpopular with many. Those of you who have followed my lectures over the decades will have some sense of my inner aversion to Strauss's title The Old Faith and the New. Nonetheless, Strauss must be given credit for unrelentingly raising the major theolo theological issues of the mid-1800s with questions such as, Do we still have religion? Are we still Christians? As in previous instances, I do not want to give yes or no answers to these questions today, nor do I want to pass judgment on Strauss. I simply want to point out that in spite of his materialism and the trivialities Nietzsche perceived in his worldview, David Friedrich Strauss was essentially honest in what he wrote. Strauss absorbed the 19th century's scientific mindset and approach to life in its entirety. He drew on the most modern intellectual accomplishments, right up to Darwin and Haeckel, to shape his inner convictions and worldview. Then with relentless honesty he asked, If I accept a worldview in line with modern sensibilities, can I still be religious in the old sense? Can I still be a Christian? For himself, Strauss answered both of these questions with an honest no. That is his personal bottom line in the balance sheet of modern soul spiritual life. <clears throat> Although as supporters of spiritual science we must speak out emphatically against David Friedrich Strauss's credo, we must nonetheless acknowledge that he and many others arrived at an honest bottom line 
Unfortunately, the same cannot be said of all similar efforts since the mid-1800s. At every turn, the representatives of various confessions seem to be attempting to obscure the issue. On the one hand, their words are full of concessions to scientific sensibilities. On the other, they continue to talk about Christianity and religion in the same old habitual terms, with none of the forthrightness of a David Friedrich Strauss. It does not occur to them to calculate a bottom line, or even to include all necessary entries in the cultural and spiritual balance sheet of our time. Obfuscation is the signature of many modern cultural trends. Attempts by small groups to arrive at an honest bottom line do not offer an effective response to this situation, but simply lead us in circles. Comfortably clinging to little thoughts is exactly what kept us from developing a viable relationship to international realities and ultimately led to the terrible catastrophe of recent years. <clears throat> These horrific experiences ought to teach humankind that it is truly time to wake up and discover points of view that can teach us to manage our life consciously instead of unconsciously allowing ourselves to be led around by the nose. Today there is no shortage of idealistic programs and associations. They proliferate like brambles because our wide-ranging intellect always allows us to come up with something reasonable to say, which we then swear on as if it were Holy Scripture. Supporters of these various political, cultural, ethical, or social programs always think that their idea of what is right for humanity needs to be implemented immediately and universally in America, Europe, Asia, and all over the globe. Very often they also think that whatever they have dreamt up will remain the absolute salvation of the whole world for all time to come. This absolutist thinking is both the fate and the cardinal sin of our modern intellectualism, which prefers not to look at the concrete human condition or how it differs between the East and the West, to give an example. Today, speaking from this perspective, I will briefly address the international cultural balance sheet by drawing attention to characteristic difference between the worldviews produced by human souls in the East and West. Here in Central Europe we have been heavily influenced by the Middle East over the centuries and millennia. On the other hand, we have been equally influenced by a newer element that has been arising in the West for some time. When we consider the foundations of Central Europe's cultural development, we turn first to Christianity, the most powerful of all impulses in humankind's earthly evolution, and in Western culture in particular. Although Christianity soon moved westward to Europe, it emerged first in the Middle East. Essentially, therefore, the Christ impulse constitutes an Eastern influence on the European psyche. Even today, as the poignant writings of Rabindranath Tagore confirm, the entire character or structure of Eastern spiritual life points back to ancient times. In Asia, the life of soul and spirit has always been paramount and has developed in a straight line from antiquity to the present day. Inasmuch as this Eastern spiritual life has also been instilled in our culture, it behooves us to make a profound inner effort to understand Eastern aspirations, and especially the ancient mighty sources of modern spirituality in the East. This spirituality is now in a stage of decadence or decline. Today even the products of the best Eastern minds can scarcely be compared to the profound meaningful spiritual life that Asia once produced for all of humankind. The further back we go, the more apparent the fundamental character of Eastern culture becomes. When we thoroughly examine everything we know about this culture, we realize that it does not originate in the soul constitution and attitudes we now consider normal in the West. The soul forces involved 
in the creation of this culture are different from the ones we ourselves apply in our advanced scientific and intellectual efforts. To really sense the character and structure of Eastern culture, although as I said it is now in decline, we must ask a question that I have often posed and attempted to answer on the basis of spiritual science. That question is, does a higher nature speak through human beings without making use of the instruments of the sensory nervous system, or of the body in general, which is what we use in our Western sciences and arts? In lectures here in Stuttgart I have often described spiritual scientific methods that are as rigorous as any of the methods of modern natural science. These spiritual techniques lead spirit researchers to the eternal, immortal aspect of the human being, which enters the inherited body through conception and birth and returns to the spiritual world when the individual passes through the portal of death. What speaks to us through Eastern culture, especially its older elements, is this immortal aspect not the aspect of ourselves that makes use of the instruments of the body and speaks through our Western science, literature, and art. The spiritual life of the East reveals what we bring with us into physical existence through conception and birth. In a certain sense, we cannot apply this spiritual aspect of ourselves here on earth, but must take it back through the portal of death. To educated Asians, real spiritual culture <coughs> emanates from the higher human being within, if I may use a somewhat trite expression, that is, from something that far transcends the everyday human being. To get a more complete idea of how those in the East related to their spiritual life in its time of flourishing, we must consider the ethical impulses we apply in the activity of distinguishing the morally right from the morally wrong. These ethical impulses appear in us as intuitions when we summon up the best forces of our inner being. We must imagine the soul forces we then experience as extending over everything they sense and feel as they conjure up their spiritual, cultural life in the physical world. There is nothing here of the sensibilities that pervade our Western sciences, philosophies, worldviews, and superficial absolutist ideas. Instead, the Eastern worldview is imbued with an awareness of receiving a transcendent, supersensible element. For a long time now, we in the West have not known how to relate to the supersensible world or its manifestations in the sense-perceptible world in this way. The so-called higher being within the ordinary human being appears in our outward morality in abstract terms, but the mighty immediate experience of how this higher being creates a spiritual culture that is the direct expression of supersensible worlds has been largely lost to Western culture. Today we ought to honest honestly acknowledge this liability in our cultural balance sheet. Now let's look at individual manifestations. On the one hand we see how the Christ impulse, as I said, flowed into all of Western culture. Its impact on Western life was once tremendous, but it has lost this impetus. In early Christian times people who were serious about deepening their Christian worldview attempted to apply supersensible knowledge to understanding the figure of the Christ. By contrast, in the 19th century, the most progressive theologians and faithful Christians were very proud of eliminating the supersensible aspect of Christ Jesus. There were, and <coughs> still are, university professors of Christian theology who are proud of seeing Christ Jesus only as the simple man from Nazareth and go to great lengths to avoid reference to his supernatural character. Even with regard to Western humanity's holiest convictions, and often even among our leading thinkers, any sense of the supersensible has gradually evaporated. <clears throat> 
We no longer know what to do with centuries of developments based on an infusion of spirit from the East. We have made even our religious heritage materialistic. The most significant phenomenon here is that theology has made Christianity materialistic. It is sheer materialism to eliminate the super-earthly Christ being who united with the personality of Jesus of Nazareth and to consider only the personal attributes of this Jesus as we do with any other historical figure. Other examples also reveal this strange relationship between the Western and the Eastern mind. Many people, whether consciously or unconsciously, with good intentions or bad, confuse our anthroposophically oriented spiritual science with the theosophy of Blavatsky and Besant. <laughs> the point I want to emphasize today, however, is not the relationship between anthroposophy and theosophy, but a small but nonetheless remarkable phenomenon in the culture of a Western imperialist nation, namely the English Theosophical Movement. Theosophy's purpose in this eminently Western culture was to deepen spiritual life and re-enliven the search for the sources of spiritual experience. How did it do this? In their quest for sources of spirit, the citizens of this nation of conquerors turned to the conquered people of India and appropriated their ancient Eastern wisdom. Because we in Central Europe chose not to do likewise, the Theosophical Society branded us as heretics. <clears throat> Compared to the former living wisdom of India, the quote, ether body, close quote, and the quote, astral body, quote, uh, close quote, which the English Theosophists borrowed from the now decadent Indian tradition, were materialistic interpretations of what the East conceives in purely spiritual terms. This example, however, is also characteristic in another way. The Western culture, epitomized by England, gave its members so little basis for seeking the sources of a new spiritual life that they were forced to borrow from decadent Eastern spiritual culture and bring it home to the West. This example exemplifies Western culture's inability to give birth to the higher spiritual eternal human being, which dwells within the mortal body and manifests in the spiritual culture of the East. Asians are eminently aware of the higher human being who inhabits not only the earthly world but also the spiritual worlds that transcend the earthly plane, if I may attempt to characterize this being in crude and stammering terms. What can we find in ordinary, everyday Western culture that is analogous to the higher human being in the East. It takes a good deal of thought to discover the corresponding element that sets the tone for all of Western culture. <coughs> ordinary reference books tell us that there are approximately 1.5 billion people living on Earth. This is true enough if we count only the two-legged beings actively involved in the work of producing human culture, but it is not true in terms of how many people it would take to do this work if it were performed only by humans, as was the case not too long ago. Increasingly, over the last three to four centuries, the achievements of Western culture have allowed us to replace human work with machine work to a considerable extent, and the goods that serve our culture are now the products of machine work as well as human work. If machines did not exist, we would soon realize how many more people would have to live on earth to make up the difference. <clears throat> the number of people needed to perform the work now done by machines can be estimated in terms of coal consumption and the like. When I did these calculations, I concluded that in addition to the current world population of 1.5 billion, 700 to 750 million additional people would have to be working on Earth, assuming an eight-hour workday. In other words, it is only partially correct 
to say that 1.5 billion humans populate the earth. It is also populated by many others who do the work humans would otherwise have to do, but these others are not human. They are humanoid machines. The Eastern psyche is somewhat uncomfortable with the idea that 700 to 750 million humanoids have invaded human culture. These humanoid co-workers, these substitutes for human energy, are the typical Western analog or counterpart of the higher spiritual human being in Eastern culture. I believe that the balance sheet of world culture would be incomplete if it did not include these two entries, the higher human being on the one hand and the subhuman on the other. In recent times, of course, the peoples of Asia have not remained idealists, but have acquired the products of Western machinery for themselves. Nonetheless, let me cite an example from the mid-1870s, because it is still characteristic of the overall structure of the spiritual culture of the East. At that time, the Japanese received their first steam-operated warships from the English. Proud to have these ships at their command, they sent their English instructors off with thanks and set out themselves. People watched from the shore as one captain turned a ship under full steam, but they grew somewhat uncomfortable as the ship went on turning and turning and wouldn't stop turning. The Englishmen who knew how to control the steering mechanism had been sent away, and so the Japanese captain had to keep turning and turning out there on the open ocean until the steam ran out. Of course, such national differences are no longer so apparent in practical matters, but they are still evident to a considerable extent to our respective inner constitutions. The relationship of educated Asians to Western intellectual culture is essentially still that of the Japanese captain who did not know how to turn off the steam. There are tremendous differences in Eastern and Western cultures, in effect an abyss still to be bridged. It is very difficult for members of one culture to find their way into the other with full inner honesty. That is why we in Central Europe wedged in between the cultures of East and West, now find ourselves in difficulty. Only the last remnants of Eastern spiritual culture suggest what that culture once was. Inasmuch as we belong to the Western world, we in Central Europe were nourished by Eastern culture for a long time. Although the event of Golgotha happened in the Middle East, it took place to benefit all of humankind, and therefore cannot be said to have come from Eastern spiritual culture. Everything that allowed the Western hearts and minds to understand the mystery of Golgotha, however, did indeed come from Middle Eastern traditions. To an unbiased view, our Christian way of thinking about this event is the last outcome of Eastern influence. Today our normal, everyday culture still survives on influxes from Asia and has not yet produced any new approaches to understanding the mystery of Golgotha and other supersensible events. But now that Eastern spiritual culture is in decline, although still adapted to modern Asians, what has it become in Europe and in Europe's extension in America? all the last vestiges of ancient Eastern spiritual currents that allowed us to understand the supersensible have become empty phrases. If we are truly aware of our modern life of soul and intellect, we must realize that a great deal of its content has been replaced by empty phrases. We are still thinking, using words either directly derived from or modeled after ancient Eastern usage. But these words, and with them a large part of our mental activity, have become devoid of meaning. Words that once held great significance in the ancient spiritual culture of the East have become empty in our mouths, in our understanding, and in our hearts.
<coughs> Unfortunately for our time, we are not yet sufficiently aware of this emptiness. Empty phrases that suffice for formulating party programs and clichéd world views can never give rise to fruitful I- actions or ideas to further humankind's development. Empty phrases can incite and propagandize, but they cannot create. Looking at the legacy of Eastern spiritual culture, we realize that the living spiritual world it once held has become empty phrases. Then we turn to the mechanistic element that has become essential to Western culture. (laughs) How do we perceive this element when the resilience of a spiritual culture no longer supports our perception. Can we deny that we take it for granted that mechanical energy replaces 700 to 750 million people on earth? Or that this fact dominates our social and political thinking and has invaded our heads? Admittedly, our culture contains a few exceptions. There have been Western individuals who sensed such things on a deeper level. Let me draw your attention once again to an important creative work by the Austrian poet Robert Hammerling, namely his title Homunculus. In this epic poem, published in the 1880s, Hammerling attempts to portray the peculiarly egotistical aspirations of a man who is entirely the product of our mechanistic culture. This man is portrayed as a billionaire whose soul is driven out by mechanistic thinking. Hamerling also anticipates many innovations, such as air traffic, that had not yet become realities in his time. To Hamerling, the sole spiritual life of a typical member of Western civilization is that of an homunculus, an artificial, machine-like human being shaped by the mechanistic powers of the outer world rather than by internalized manifestations of the supersensible world. When we consider keenly perceptive descriptions of Western life by a modern educated man of the East, such as Tagore, we experience secondhand the fervor of the author's spiritual world view as he reclaims the spiritual world of the East. Although Tagore speaks in Eastern nuances I cannot imitate, He describes all of the Western world's perceptions of nature and social or political thinking in the same way as Hammerling's homunculus. In Western culture, the echoes of the former spiritual greatness of the East have become mere empty phrases. To Asians, the great achievements of Western civilization are humanoid culture. (coughs) People who take the easy way out will accuse me of exaggerating, I know, but only because they lack the courage to call a spade a spade or resist understanding. In spite of their objections, it is time for an honest accounting in our collective soul-spiritual life. We must be especially aware of the liabilities of Western culture that I have described here today. The aftermath of the last world catastrophe should finally make it tangibly obvious, as was evident to any unbiased view even before 1914, that the humanoid character of the Anglo-American Empire has spread over much of the world. I am not saying this because I happen to be speaking in a German city. I have made similar statements elsewhere in recent weeks, and for quite some time now. I have also been telling Anglo-Americans that Central Europeans are actually better off than they are, because a great deal of responsibility has now shifted from the German-speaking nations to the Anglo-American side. We have it easier, because we no longer bear such responsibility for, quote, the rapacious acquisition of foreign territory, close quote, as one perceptive Englishman recently described it to me. By contrast, anyone who lives in an Anglo-American nation and still has some human sensitivity, must feel the burden of a gigantic responsibility for humankind's further development. For us, however, what is the crucial aspect of the mechanistic international culture epitomized 
by the Anglo-American world. As a representative of spiritual science, I am not about to issue a thunderous, reactionary denunciation of this mechanistic culture, nor would it occur to me, even for a moment, to express any backward-looking thoughts about restoring old institutions or doing away with even a single achievement of our modern culture. We must respect the inevitabilities of the world's evolution, and modern mechanistic culture is as necessary and inevitable as the old spiritual culture. But what is its crucial element? Eastern culture, before it fell into decadence, focused on striving for the divine spirit in each individual. Today, however, this culture has become the product of martyr-like drives and has largely exchanged its spiritually based management of public affairs for a version imported from Western Europe. The East has lost its greatness and its inner impulse, and the breath of the past hangs over its spiritual culture. The fact that many Westerners are now turning to the East for help with their own faltering spiritual life is also a sign of decadence, a sign that all good spirits have been forced out of Western humanity. The current outer manifestations of Eastern culture, however, have no future. Grotesque as it may sound, the breath of the future hangs over our Western mechanistic culture. I am not speaking as a reactionary when I talk about Western culture, nor do I want to do away e- nor do I want to do away even its smallest detail. Nonetheless, it remains a fact <clears throat> that as this culture spread through the labor of its 700 to 750 million subhuman mechanized inhabitants, we real humans were left no life of spirit and soul capable of energetically intervening in such a mechanized world. It is my belief, or rather it is an insight derived from spiritual science, which is more than just a belief, that the same spiritual energy that, when applied exclusively to the sense-perceptible world of space and time, manifests in mechanics and great technology, also inspires anthroposophical spiritual science, as I have presented it over the last two decades. The spiritual activity that created our machines and our mechanistic culture would have been impossible to reconcile with the spiritual life of the creators of Eastern spiritual culture. Such spiritual activity would have crushed them. They were not meant to be surrounded by mechanized life, but we Westerners are. We are meant to apply our intelligence and employ all of our human forces of spirit and soul in developing the inner strength to master our mechanized electro-technical culture in its entirety. Starting from the same basic spiritual configuration, we must transcend the sense-perceptible world to develop the soul forces that I described in title How to Know Higher Worlds and the second part of title, The Philosophy of Freedom. These soul forces will lead us into supersensible worlds in a way that was never possible in the ancient East. Taking as our starting point the same spirit that suffuses the laws governing our machinery and electronics, we must undergo inner development that allows us to perceive the spiritual worlds that Easterners once saw but we must perceive them in a different way, a way that is as rigorously scientific as the methods of any modern science. We Westerners, however, are at the very beginning of this process, and as yet very few people acknowledge that it is possible, let alone necessary. Nonetheless, we must develop a spiritual science that is equal in power and comprehension to all of the scientific and cognitive efforts known in the modern Western world. As we attempt to characterize this new spiritual science, we cannot resort to mouthing the empty phrases that are becoming the currency of religious denominations. 
the same seriousness and drive that we apply to our outer sciences must also be applied to developing spiritual science. We have now seen the outcome of a rational effort to add up the assets and liabilities of our time. If we continue to develop our social and political views only on the basis of the natural sciences, then we will post only liabilities, and our sociological or historical overviews will explain only the dying aspects of our public and historical affairs. The natural sciences allow us to understand only dead matter, and if we apply the science of death to public and historical activity, we will understand only their dying aspects. This explains why new social theories, which are now actually being implemented after a period of merely criticizing the status quo, are having such deadly effects on real life. They were created in the image of death. We will derive truly socially responsible views only from sources that must also feed our modern supersensible activity. Viewpoints derived from a merely mechanistic view of nature are liabilities, as are lifeless copies of centuries-old religious denominations that have lost their vitality. Now more than at any other time, humankind needs the power of the Christ, but we need a new way to find him. All of the old ways, whether obvious or disguised, belong in the liability column. We need assets, and in this case the assets will come from the renewal of our spiritual worldview. Today this path is still too difficult for many, especially in the West. Lately we have seen the emergence of an odd quasi-spiritual trend. Instead of learning about the spiritual world through the human soul's own strengths, it attempts to do so through imitations of scientific experiments that entice gods or spirits or the souls of the dead to pay the occasional visit to the physical sense-perceptible world. Spiritism makes do with such theatrical displays, but they are the opposite of a genuine quest for spirit. If we truly seek spirit today, it is not enough to receive the occasional visit from spiritual beings on display in a theater in order to prove the existence of a spiritual world that we ignore in our outer life. We cannot allow the materialistic course of our life to continue. <clears throat> what have scientists like Lambroso done? The natural sciences remain devoid of spirit for them. So scientists turn to spiritualism to discover something beyond the natural world. Meanwhile, the rest of their lives becomes ever more materialistic. What we really need, however, is spiritual deepening that can truly make inroads into our material life and accompany it every step of the way. My ongoing mission is to describe a spiritual life of, excuse me, a spiritual view of life complete with ideas that can shape actions and soul forces that can generate morality and religious reverence. I will continue to demonstrate that this spiritual science is already here in the content of my lectures over the past two decades. Today my intention was to describe this spiritual striving as an asset to offset the many liabilities of our modern culture. No matter what the political future holds, it should be possible for the much-tested German-speaking peoples, wedged in between East and West as we are, to base a new quest for spirit on the groundwork done by our great cultural forebears. In future, if we have the inner energy to take this route to the spirit, we should be able to tell the East about a spiritual life that it once possessed in different form, but has since lost. The East will receive this from us if we succeed in informing the West about spiritual activity that can meet all the challenges presented by our purely mechanistic culture. If we seek this new route to the Spirit, 
we will fulfill an essential task in Central Europe. The recent catastrophic events seem to have held strange consequences for the German-speaking peoples. It is quite true that we not only allowed ourselves to be overwhelmed by the precipitous ascendancy of economic activity in the West, but we also took part in the search for spiritual renewal in the impotent East. Nonetheless, it seems to me, I will resist the temptation to say it is a fact, that even at the peak of our materialistic aspirations we proved we have no gift for materialism. (laughs) We must look elsewhere for that gift, in some other part of the world. If adversity leads us to recognize our lack of talent for materialism, perhaps this recognition will encourage us to explore a spirituality that is our own and not borrowed from the East. Perhaps the roots of our strength which lie in the pure distillation of thinking to which German culture aspired at the turn of the 18th to the 19th century will still give rise to spiritual work on behalf of the further development of humanity as a whole. Whatever else the fate of the German people may entail, if we seek spiritual renewal by returning to our cultural roots we will realize that the Germanic spirit has not yet reached its peak. (laughs) It will live on in future actions and future concerns, and we hope it will still inform humanity's future from this spiritual perspective.